what we really wanted to do with this session is that um, I've known Graham for many years. Graham is probably one of uh, Australia's most successful financial entrepreneurs, originally out of the kind of resources investment sector and, and investment banking beforehand. Um, and then set up, um, so how many years, 14 years ago now? Yeah. 14 years mm -hmm. ago now. Set up a, a fabulous successful business in, in London, well, at, well, London and Channel Islands, um, called ETF Securities. And that's one of the biggest ETF firms in the world. Um, and certainly one of the biggest ETF players or ETP players in the uh, alternative asset space, uh, commodities. Mm -hmm. So, for instance, they have a phenomenally successful physically backed gold uh, ETP, mm -hmm. yeah, um, which is, uh, I mean, far and away the biggest seller in the UK, very successful. Um, and um, th we thought it would be interesting to get Graham's perspective because he... Um, He's a leading player in the whole ETF space. And the ETF space is the one nearest space that we can think of that has the same disruptive potential. Um, and there are two common characteristics, well, three actually, but two ones we're going to kick off on, which is, first of all, um, the ETF business, and particularly Graham's business, ETF Securities, um, and, and Graham is Australian through and through, although he has lived for many years with us POMs. So um, he's built a business off alternative assets. That is still the core of what you do. Mm -hmm. um, and you've, you've not just effectively structured up and packaged up gold and commodities. You've packaged up a whole range of things which were previously fairly inaccessible and are now phenomenally accessible on D2C platforms. A lot of people... So if you go to an outfit like Hargreaves Lansdowne, which is one of our biggest D2C platforms for investment in the UK, you look down their top five or ten shares traded on a weekly basis, you'll probably see one of this company's products in there, kind of a gold product, a, a, a kind of a free times returns product, short leverage product, all that kind of stuff. Phenomenally successful. It's really got through to the mainstream. So packaging up alternatives and then also technology because ETFs are fundamentally a technology. Correct. And their technology is they are absolutely blowing a hole through the traditional asset management model, which was the same as in Australia probably, same in the UK. Traditional model was pay an IFA, uh, loads of money for retrocessions, uh, and then basically, uh, basically bang the end investor with 150 basis points at cost. Um, and fund managers wouldn't think twice even about charging 200 basis points. Those days are gone. And the average ETF now is coming in probably about 50, 40? Yep, yeah, less than that. that. Yeah, less than that. Um, and so blow technology is blowing a hole, and robo-advice is coming along as well. So that's the big backdrop for our conversation. And there's a third issue, which I know Graham wants to raise, about trust. But let, let's, because I think trust is really important. You have to really get investors' trust. Um, but let's start with the alternative assets issue first. Your, if I look for your mix well, of products... Can, can I just yeah. start by saying, I, I, you know, Paul Clitheroe might have been the oldest guy in the room, but I think I might be the second oldest <laughs> guy. And I'm sitting here listening to all this stuff, yeah. and it's sort of where we were 10 years ago. Yeah, it was, not it? And this is like deja vu, which is why I'm absolutely fascinated to be here. But as David says, it's just another replay on, on technology. Yeah. changing things substantially. And for our business, I mean, you might have seen Warren Buffett's letter on, on the weekend, where he is just absolutely scathing on active fund managers and hedge funds in particular and saying the whole industry has cost people $100 billion in assets, an old book called Where Are the Customers' Yachts? And, and that's what our business is still doing. We're still using this mm. technology to disrupt. So don't think disruption just occurs over a year or two it's actually going to take 10, 20, 30 years to be complete. But sorry, Okay, Dave. no, no, we'll come back yeah. to that, actually, yeah. then. So just on the alternative assets, if I look at your book, I'd guess that, uh, well, 80% of your book's alternative assets or some yeah, form? It yeah, it's yeah, about 25 billion in assets. Yeah. We have. So um, what are the key things? If you, or A lot of people out here run platforms or involved in platforms or funding platforms that have got alternative lending assets, but they're alternative assets. What are the key things you think they need to watch out for moving forward? Well, the, the first thing, the most important thing you've ever got to do is define yourself as an asset class. Yeah. And, and that's been talked about a little bit earlier. And, and we struggled very early on because we'd go along to the big investment managers and say, OK, we've got gold or commodities and we think they're an asset class. And they say, well, I don't know whether you should talk to the equity fund manager because it, it's not equities mm. and you shouldn't talk to the bond manager because it's not bonds. So actually, we don't know who the hell you should talk to. 
and it was only after a few years when the, the newspapers and people like David and a whole lot of others and the stock exchanges started to provide sections on their listing platforms yeah. that defined us as a separate asset class. Now you go to the London Stock Exchange as a whole class, the ASX, it's got the same thing. They, you can actually see it as a separate asset. And that was really helpful. But until you actually get acknowledged as an asset class, it's very, very difficult because no one knows who to talk to. And, it, and once defined as an asset class, you've got more credibility. I'm seeing that discussion here today. All day. But I, I think, you know, is this... Is who's, this the who's the gatekeepers, do you think? <sighs> I, I think the... Um, uh, in in uh, uh, For this type of business, it may well be the regulators defining it as a separate asset class. Yep. Uh, it may... Uh, the stock exchanges aren't terribly relevant here. Uh, newspapers, I think... I've heard talk about an industry body getting together, but I think it really is helpful if everybody uses the same language and knows where everybody fits in. I mean, I, I opened the book and I saw all these different companies. I'm thinking, how the hell do, do, does the jigsaw fit together? Where do they all sit? So yeah, because I, one of the, uh, like you, I talk a lot to, say, wealth advisors in the mm. UK, um, and they, they, they have a real problem in the UK um, understanding this asset class because you're absolutely right. They don't understand whether or not it's equities. Usually it is, because it's usually structured in an investment trust, which is an equity, so they sort of buy it. But all the expertise should sit in the fixed income side, mm -hmm. but the fixed income guys go, this isn't an asset class. Mm -hmm. So the issue is absolutely one of classification. Are there any other issues to do with alternative assets that you think this industry needs to get its heads around? Well, I think it's to where they're pitching. Uh, I, I heard the gentleman earlier today saying they were doing uh, loans to consumers or something, but it's, and they were unprofitable. It's only when they move to the small businesses they, yeah. they become profitable. I think the secret to this industry is untapping institutional money. Yeah. Now, the problem with institutional money, though, is quite flighty. Um, so, uh, I mean, it, it can be patient, though, it's depending how it's structured. I was, going to ask, well, I was yeah. exactly going to come on to. So ETFs traditionally have been regarded as quite a... F I mean, I know Jack Bogle, who's the founder of Vanguard, uh, and everybody thinks of Vanguard as this company that loves ETFs, and actually he hates ETFs. Um, he hates certain aspects. Absolutely. Of them, but he loves other aspects. Loves passive funds. And yeah. one of the things he doesn't like about ETFs, he thinks the money's a bit flighty. But in your experience, cause I, I know we go, that's yeah. not the case, no, is it? No, it's not the case at all. I mean, theoretically, we've got a book of 25 billion in assets. Theoretically, it could, the entire book could be liquidated within 48 hours. That's because that's the liquidity we guarantee everybody. But in practice, it isn't, because it's almost like bank accounts. That you, you, you know you put your money in there knowing you've got absolute ability to take it out at any time, but most people just leave it there. So, uh, but ours are positive investment strategies, but the more, as long as people have got confidence in your business, yeah. You know, they may, you know, asset allocate away and in, in, into your various type of investments from time to time. But, but overall, if, as long as they've got confidence, you can be sure the money's going to be there longer term. So a classic example is gold. So gold, you, you were the, you're the, the pioneers in the physical allocated gold so that you could actually see a piece of paper that's which from a, a custodian, isn't it? I think yep. I, I never work out how it works. It says it's stored, in, it's stored here. It's in the vault, custom. yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Um, now, when gold prices were going up and down, interesting talking to some of your guys, I thought, you know, vote flows would be in and out, and it's a competitive market. There are people trying to undercut you sure. all the time. They didn't actually go out, did they? No, they, they didn't. Why not? What, 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 what ten, well, because people were taking a long-term view. And I, and I think as long as you can sell people on the idea that they're not wanting to invest just for the short term, yes, give them the liquidity when they need it, but approach it with the view that, that, that it's a longer-term investment, uh, then that's, a, a, that's an interesting balance. So they've got the confidence that they can get liquidity whenever they need it, but it's almost a case of give them the liquidity and they won't actually use it. If they're not sure of liquidity, they'll sure as hell be pressing at the gates to get their money yeah, back. Exactly. And I want to bring up this issue of trust, though. So I, I, I intimated earlier, in your field, let's, say, let's use gold as an example, there are other gold funds out there, and some of them are cheaper than you. Sure. People don't go to them, no, though, do they? they? They don't, because they, they, they come to us uh, um, for, for the trust in, in the business. They come to so us what for, does that, for Can the I just pick apart that trust a bit? What do you think well, that means? The, the, the problem is, for, for some companies, you know, the question is, how long is the company going to be there? And one of the issues yeah. I'm seeing today is, would I put my money in some of these companies? Well, the first thing I'd want to know is, can I get my money back? I mean, as I understand it, so many of the businesses here at the moment are still losing money. So if I go online and suddenly one day the website's down and the company's disappeared, what the hell do I do? 
Mm. So one of my first questions is, are you profitable? And what's my protection against you guys going broke? Now, our business was slightly different. We used to answer this question all the time. I was about to say, because you, you, you... Yeah, I mean, you know, people were investing 100 million ticks at us at the time. But I always said to them, guys, if we go broke, this is how you're going to get your money back. So we, we were quite open about it. You know, we, we were lucky to have a business model that we, we generated working capital as we expanded, which is highly unusual. Um, but therefore, we, you know, weren't particularly looking as own going broke. And, and we didn't actually particularly, even though we got to unicorn status, we didn't particularly need any VC money to get there at all. We got a very small amount, and in the end, we didn't even need it. So I think one of the problems I'm seeing with the industry here is, can you prove that you can actually give your customers money back on, on the asset side if you're going broke, or are you going to rely on a continual round of VC funding? Yeah. Um, uh, are there any other elements of trust in that that you think are important? Um, I, I think uh, t trust comes about transparency. It's yeah. absolutely critical. In other words, uh, I think Paul mentioned it earlier. If you're paying a rate that's too good to be true, then there's a problem. So I, I, I think there's, there's nothing hard about just explaining on your websites uh, and, and over the phone and however else you do it, what is the business model? How much are you, is it costing you? How much are you paying away? What are you earning, etc. I mean, for example, our business, anybody can earn out, ex anybody can calculate on any day of the year exactly how much our revenues are on a daily basis. They can't necessarily know exactly how much our costs are, but they can sort of broadly work it out. So they can work out whether we're profitable or not, and I think that, and, and why. And they can also work out our profitability against our competitors. It's a very, very open model, and we put all this data out. Our competitors put all this data out because it engenders the trust. So, you know, I, I'd encourage people who, you know, I, I think it's going to get to the level of it's not just explaining the pure business model, it's also explaining the overall economics of the business to give people the confidence that these businesses are going to survive. And it's interesting as well, because you, 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 along with a couple of other outfits, have been very, very open in talking about total cost of ownership. Absolutely. Um, and Because and everybody in, in the ETF industry talks about things like a, a TER, total expense ratio. But you, actually, that doesn't capture the full cost of everything. So mm -hmm. it's one other thing that people in this industry got to do. They've got to be very open about the total cost of lending, total cost of ownership, and they've got to basically be explicit about every single turn, cost and charge they take. Yeah, we, we get grilled enormously on every step in the chain, and this yeah. is why we're able to deliver product uh, at a, a, a price that is sometimes a little bit more expensive than our, our competitors, because we're not cutting corners, and, and in our particular industry, it's the bid offer spread on the stock exchange. It's really important to the cost uh, to, to many traders. And, and that sort of confidence in spread yeah. can vaporise in a minute if the yeah. market makers aren't behind you and, you and you don't have all those relationships. So a lot of it's about relationships. So, you know, any, anybody can put up a great business model when the world's going well and when they're going well. The question is, what happens when, you know, the shit is the fan, basically. You know, the, the GFC comes on. When the GFC hit us, you know, the customers loved our experience. They came to us and they liquidated something like $8 billion in three days. And we didn't mind it. We said, fine, OK, we're losing assets today, but we're proving that we're, that, you know, we're supplying the very thing you need, cash in a crisis. So the question is, what is going to happen to your business if something really tough happens? And it's not necessarily to you. I mean, if a lending club happens, then you know, everybody in the industry is affected who's got similar, has been. Yeah. got similar business models. Um, let's move to the disruption mm -hmm. angle, the t technology angle. I mean, most people don't look at ETFs as technologies, but I think you and I do. Yeah, because you they could, are technologies. I mean, fact, you know, I mean, you, you had investment funds invented. You know, you got the 1940 Act in the US that brought in all that sort of stuff, and, and similar in Australia, you got the MIS legislation, CIS in the UK, and it's all about if, if you you would never have unit trusts and managed funds if people had computers 50, 60 years ago, mm. like, because they would have just done the ETFs because they're a hell of a lot cheaper. Mm. It, all it is is a computer way of buying a certain number of shares and, and away you'd go. But people didn't have computers and, and it's just a hell of a lot cheaper way of doing it. And, and what's astonishing is, is that wave of disruption you know, is carrying on just 
eating away into the mainstream mutual fund industry to the point at which in the US, on an average monthly basis, there are more ETFs sold now than traditional mutual funds. Well, I mean, last year in the US, you had something like 500 billion moving into ETFs and 350 billion moving out mm. of mutual funds. In other words, an 850 million sw billion swing. How long did and it that, take? That's part of it. How long did it take to get to that tipping point, though? Because it, cause, cause there's been a lot of talk today about uh, sort of uh, non-traditional lenders, alternative lenders versus the banks. Mm. And it was very noticeable that Shane from ANZ, watching the... ANZ, uh, though. Yeah, sorry, <laughs> appalling, appalling English person. There we go. Um, was the looking, Americans say that. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. <laughs> um, it was, look, it was, was watching the space very carefully, yeah. but I didn't notice the sense of fear in his voice. Um, so they really don't think this is going to topple them. And actually, if I had talked to the average active fund manager 15 years ago, I think they would not have been terrified by ETFs. No, no. I, I talk to them now, they're all absolutely terrified of ETFs. They are literally watching it going, oh. this is destroying a model. When, how long did it take to get to the tipping point where the traditional model basically fell over? And was it really just a point about cost? Well, I think it, a lot of it's about cost, yeah. and, and I think a lot of it's going to be about cost in, in banking generally. I mean, let's face it, in, in uh, you know, the, some of the biggest hotel groups in the world, sitting there like Hilton and Starwood and people like that, they didn't even. They thought their biggest competitor was each other, and bang, out of the back, they didn't even see them coming. Airbnb, it's the biggest hotel group in the world. They didn't even see it coming. So you know, don't assume you know who your competitor is through this massive disruption. But the Australian banks are sitting there on mortgages. It's absolutely their bread and jam. Yeah. You know, th there is no reason why a new generation will say, well, why don't I do my mortgage this way? What else do I ever need out of a bank? But now, how long some companies, like the Shane was talking about these yellow toys he's talking about, like mining companies and getting big caterpillars. You know, that's understandable. But, you know, what else do you need out of a bank apart from a mortgage? Prob nothing, nothing for most people. How long do you think it would take? How long did I, I, I think it can happen very quickly when it happens, but it's going to be a change in mindset. So the problem we've got is we're dealing with many uh, wealth managers who are from an older generation who believe active fund management can, can outperform passive management. Well, you know, read Warren Buffett, he says 99.9% .9 of them can't. Mm -hmm. So, but, but we still get people of the older generation that believe they can. The younger kids are coming through, they're, start, they're, you know, they're starting as graduates, they're getting to the next level. They are soon going to be in the senior positions and then you're going to have that massive wall that everybody's saying, well, it's never going to happen and then suddenly, bing, it happens all in a few years' time. And that could well happen in this space. You can, yeah, it's a bit like that. asparagus. You can just be sitting in there for a while and then suddenly, boom. Well, not my asparagus, yeah. I can't grow them properly. Um, but um, but in, in the ETF industry, uh, the first ETFs came out, what, realistically, mid-90s? Uh, yeah, yeah. yeah, with, with uh, a spider. Yeah. Absolutely, with spider. And it, so, so they are actually... It took years. To I was exactly what fact, I was going to get to. No, the, 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 the two biggest ETFs in the world a few years ago were the spider, which is the S&P 500 in the US, yep. and the GLD, which is the gold product. The first product that they came out, the spider, um, they, they t someone took the idea to the New York Stock Exchange, they said this had never worked. This had never worked, didn't they? The Amex <laughs> said, okay, this might work, so they went to uh, uh, one provider at the time uh, and they said, no, this won't work, and it got rejected by them and somebody else took it on. So it was taken on on the basis, this will never work. And then the GLD, the gold one, that was taken to iShares and then they said, look, this is at the World Gold Council, and they said, oh, this is a terrific idea. iShares said, no, this will never work. <laughs> State Street took it on only because they were almost paid to do so, and <laughs> bingo, it just takes off. So here you've got the two leading examples of products that people thought would not work, and they've become the le absolute leaders on a global basis within a matter of a few years. But the tipping point for the industry did take about, if, I'm sort of, if I go from the mid-90s... 10, uh, 10, 15 years. Yeah, 10, 15 years. Mm -hmm. So this industry, in the U certainly in, in Australia, is only about two, three years in. In America, it's, we're now what, about... What, the ETF business? Uh, no, uh, the, oh, uh, well, the alternative Peter. finance business. Yeah, oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. So in America, it's about eight years. So mm. in a sense, if we are going to follow the disruptive model of ETS, there's still a few years to go. Oh, yeah. I mean, we're, we're thinking that, broadly speaking, the complete disruption by ETFs of the in investment management model, because it should all be about our asset allocation rather yeah. than uh, stock picking, uh, is probably going to take 30 to 40 years. Oh, really? Okay. Mm -hmm. um, and on that technology... To be complete. To be complete. And on that technology piece, what, what I think is even more specifically interesting for this sector is, is that in the UK, you've got a very successful... Uh, robotics um, and uh, you've also got a cyber 
security uh, ETF, which mm. literally, I mean, last time I talked to Graham, I, th I think the, the, the robotics one, and it is about robots, um, and automated engineering was t 10, 20, 30 million, and now suddenly it's like hundreds of millions. No, a few hundred a million now. Absolutely. So um, uh, do you, you must therefore have a view about, uh, about technological disruption in the asset management space and the lending space. Do you sense that the banks and the big asset managers are vulnerable? Almost speaking with, a, with, an equity, with an equity hat on, do you think that a fintech, for instance, ETF could work? Yes, definitely. Mm. Absolutely, without a doubt. Right. But, um, but what we've got to do is just make sure there's, an, there's enough um, businesses out there. I mean, we, generally, we need them listed, and there's only a handful that are there at the moment. And so. they presumably need to be profitable. Mm. Mm. And yes, exactly. <laughs> that vital ingredient. Yeah. Um, okay, so uh, and what about robo-advice? Robo as, as a firm, Altfire, we're looking more at robo-advice. Not necessarily because we think that the robo-advisors themselves, startups, will be all successful, because it's a difficult mm. market. But it, 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 robo-advice robo is going to, and that's relevant for this industry, because there are robo-advisors in the peer-to-peer -peer space. It, do we think that that's going to absolutely wipe out the traditional advisor model? What's your sense about where, where no, robo-advice will No, I, I don't think it will. I, I think people are very happy to go online once they're dealing with certain amounts of money, but once they get to much, much larger amounts of money, yeah. they'd rather do it in a different way. They, they may execute some of the stuff online, yeah. but actually just... The only relationship you've got is with a computer. Uh, that does not work once you've got bigger amounts of money. What um, do you think the but, cutoff but, but point uh, is? Well, I think you know one, once someone's investing over half a million dollars, a million dollars, you know, it's a bit. I mean, you know, I, I've heard presentations from Wealthfront and, and Betterment in the U.S. In, in, at big conferences, and uh, it's interesting that, that they they came on early and they got this wall of money, and I think there was sort of a wall of money sitting there ready to be invested. But that seems to have plateaued. I think there's a space for it. Uh, the cost of acquisition of companies is, is, uh, can be pretty high, uh, yeah. depending on what you're chasing. I mean, Nutmeg in, in the uh, UK is still struggling uh, financially. Yep. Um, the other guys, the two ones I mentioned in the US, are profitable as far as I understand it. But it it's, can be a long game, uh, and it's really you know, what your business model is and what you're targeting. But, but I, think there's, I think what will happen is, as they become better known, the people with more money, in other words, the, the, you know, the sort of 40, 50 year olds or whatever, I think they may start to open up that, that area and, and make it more profitable. So I think that could be quite interesting in many different ways. Um, do you think though, I mean, one of my underlying questions here is, is a lot of the platforms here particularly will be thinking about, do I focus on DTC or do I focus on intermediate, advi intermediate advice? I, do I try and get my product, whatever my product is, SME funding, doesn't really matter what it is. Mm -hmm. um, do I try and just go straight to the market uh, and I'm assuming institutions are a different issue. Um, they go straight to the market, or do I go for the advised route? And if you're to believe the great, the great paragons of the robo-advice revolution, your average IFA, we call them in the UK, I don't know, RIA oh, in America. Ara, Ara, yeah, yeah, RIA in America. Do you think they are basically stuffed? Well, I think they've got to learn to work with them. Yeah. Uh, and, and I think, for example, a conference like this will change dramatically in the next few years. I think the, the majority of the people in this room are probably very much involved in the industry. And this happened in a big ECF conference in, in, in the US and Florida each year, where the for early years of it was just the industry almost talking to itself. And it started off two or 300 people, it's now got 1,700 people, and the big push was all the influencers, the, the financial advisors, are then coming along and receiving much sympathy. So I, I think fr from our point of view, what we try and do instead of trying to market direct to customers, we try and actually market to the influencers. Now, wh whether that's the financial advisors or whether in, your, in many of your cases it might be the brokers or whether it might be the newspapers, the columnists, online, whatever, I, I, I think it's, it's too expensive and too hard to go direct to the customers. You, you're much better off going through the intermediaries in one form or another, either just you know, paying, retros paying retrocessions or trailers or fees is a very, very uh, expensive way of doing it and not a great business. Proving to them what is in it for their clients and them having a fiduciary duty to perform the best for their clients is absolutely the best way to go. And just one last question. Um, as addressing directly the issue of profitability here. Um, your business was profitable quite early on. Mm -hmm. A lot of the businesses here aren't profitable early on. 
what's the one simple bit of advice you could say about how they can make themselves get to that cash flow profitability? Because that's quite crucial, isn't it? It was crucial for you as a business. Sure. Um, was, is there one simple, there never is, is there? Yeah, but is there one simple? Make sure the bank account matches the spreadsheet on your business forecasts. Simple as that. <laughs> <laughs> Excellent. Um, I'm aware of time. Uh, are there any quick questions from the audience? We've, uh, we've talked for 25 minutes. Any questions from the audience? No. Graham, I think they're all okay. profitable. I don't think they need okay. our advice Good. about working capital. Um, Graham, thank you very much for coming okay. along. Um, Graham will be lurking around for a bit while, and I'm sure you can grab him. Thank you very much. Okay. Thank Thanks you, Graham. Thank you. Okay. Very grateful.